Hi, this is Tiff Shuttlesworth. Welcome to our broadcast today. And in our broadcast, we're going to be answering several questions that came in, and many of them center around uh, some concerns and questions about Bible prophecy and so on. But the title of our study today is, Did Donald Trump's Assassination Attempt Fulfill Bible Prophecy? As you can imagine, we've received all kinds of comments and direct messages and emails, a lot of information, a lot of misinformation circulating in these days as the world is watching America to see how we're going to handle uh, this crisis. Did the assassination attempt of Donald Trump fulfill Bible prophecy? And uh, I want to begin by highlighting two very important things, and I want you to listen carefully. Uh, number one, this channel is dedicated to training and equipping uh, you, our students, our followers, in understanding the sound teachings of the scriptures, as well as an emphasis upon Bible prophecy. And then secondly, uh, I always have and always will, I pledge to you, I always have, I always will abstain uh, from social media clickbait, from political sensationalism, and uh, of course weak-minded banter uh, that has no biblical benefit. And so in spite of the title of our Bible study today, this is going to be a Bible study. And uh, I don't ever want you, our listeners and followers, to feel awkward about asking questions like this. And uh, in the questions that have come in concerning this recent assassination attempt, I actually thought it was a fair question. Did the assassination attempt of Donald Trump fulfill Bible prophecy? Now, I suspect that many who are thinking that or those that have asked that or something similar to that are asking in response to many of the false prophets that pollute our social media channels and present uh, what can be called, I don't know how to be gracious other than to say senseless clickbait, and I get it. But uh, I work very hard to provide content for you uh, that's designed specifically for serious students of the Bible. And so if you have a way of taking notes in your Bible and a highlighter, uh, we're going to get started. <clears throat> Obviously, this recent assassination attempt has resulted in many of our followers uh, having concerns, calling for prayer, uh, asking questions, trying to connect the dots concerning Bible prophecy in the end times and false messiahs and false prophets and so on. But in today's Bible study, I'm going to focus in on three questions uh, that came in that are interrelated to uh, our subject material today, and I'm going to do my best to bring biblical clarity to those questions. And so if you want to write those three questions down, number one, did God prevent the assassination of Donald Trump? Uh, several have asked my opinion on that. And uh, I'll share with you what I feel. And it's, uh, again, a good question because we've got some pretty incredible circumstances I think we would all agree. And so question number one in our Bible study, people have asked me, do you believe that God supernaturally protected Donald Trump? Question number two that I'm going to answer is, what do I think about all of the social media prophets who have come out of the woodwork uh, trying to lay claim that they predicted this or they prophesied this and they're running clips. And to be honest with you, some of them are very detailed and very specific and others are very generalized and vague and shallow. But I will in this Bible study address prophets and social media prophets and give to you three standards of testing social media prophets that I think will be of great value to you, uh, both in this present uh, chaotic time of media press and social media being on fire. There are three ways biblically that I want you to always evaluate 
prophets and prophecy. And then the third question, which is the title of our study today, did the assassination attempt on Donald Trump fulfill Bible prophecy? And there is a specific passage in the last book of the Bible that there has been some social media videos on and some, uh, again, uh, erroneous teaching on that uh, for whatever reason, this stuff oftentimes catches like a fire in the winds of excitement and, and news cycles just cause it to spread. We'll conclude with that. With that said, open your Bible into the 13th chapter uh, of Revelation. Uh, I'm going to uh, begin with that, and I'm also going to end with that. And as always, we're going to start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible. Revelation chapter 13, just two verses today, and that's verse 3 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 13, verses 3 and 4. I want you to highlight that in your Bible. If you've listened to me teach out of Revelation 13 before, uh, many of you already have. But there the Bible said, I saw that one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. Pause right there. Uh, this is a legitimate Bible prophecy. John, the author of the book of Revelation, talks about a charismatic political leader in the last days that will sustain a head wound and Many people that know a little bit about the Bible uh, have asked questions, and there are those that are trying to take that passage and link it to Donald Trump and the attempt uh, upon his life recently. Uh, let, let's read on. But the fatal wound was healed, and the whole world marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. And that is another reason why some uh, have erroneously tried to tie this assassination attempt uh, into Bible prophecy because they're pointing out the fact that uh, this uh, assassination attempt upon the previous president has almost made him a god and uh, iconic for sure, and it'll be in the history of politics until the end of time. And it's almost immortalized Donald Trump as a presidential candidate and a past president. So we'll come back to that. Verse 4, they worshipped the dragon for giving the beast such power, and they also worshipped the beast. Who is as great as the beast, they exclaim, who is able to fight against him? And again, who is able to fight against him? And many of you have seen on the news him rising out of the secret service bodies and pumping his fist with the blood on his face saying, fight, fight, fight. And uh, I understand why those who uh, perhaps are limited in biblical interpretation could take a passage like this and try to squeeze this current assassination attempt into the passage and ask questions about it. And uh, I'm going to do my best to answer those for you uh, today. As we always do, uh, before we answer those three questions, let's begin our Bible study by praying together. Uh, Heavenly Father, once again, in the name of Jesus, uh, we bow before you in prayer. Uh, the Bible warned us in Bible prophecy that in the last days perilous times would come. Uh, you prophesied very distinctly in the scriptures the political chaos of the last days. But we pause, first of all, those of us that live in the United States of America, uh, we pray for the civil war-like conditions that it seems like our country is moving towards. And we pray for a revival in America. We pray for a spiritual awakening. We pray for genuine repentance in the hearts of leaders, not only in our nation, but worldwide. We also pause to pray because though many are talking about the assassination attempt upon Donald Trump, there were people that were both wounded and killed. And we pray for them and for their families and for their loved ones uh, in this difficult time. 
I pray for the mother and the father of the shooter. I can only imagine as a parent the confusion and the hurt uh, and the ache deep in their hearts that they must be going through. We pray for our presidential candidates and their families. Uh, not only Donald Trump, we pray for Joe Biden and for his family and for any and all who may come under harm. But most importantly, we now pause to pray for those who are listening today that may in their own hearts not know where they stand with Christ. What if their life were to suddenly end because one thing this has certainly caused me to be reminded of is that razor thin line between our life on earth and its termination. And you said in the Bible in the book of Hebrews in the ninth chapter, it is appointed unto all men once to die and after that the judgment. Every single one of us, every single listener has an appointment unknown and one day we will stand before God. My prayer is that every person listening would turn from sin, turn to Christ, and live ready every day to meet Him. And in the moments to come at the close of our study, when we pray for those who need Christ and those that are perhaps backslidden or away from the Lord, I pray that you would give them the faith and the courage and the humility to do what they ought to do. And for all things, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory for you alone are worthy. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Uh, by the way, I'm going to uh, leave uh, all the questions uh, and the conspiracy theories and, and the wonderings and the possibilities and how did this happen and why was this not secured and all of the things that the media outlets are are covering. I'm going to leave it to the media outlets and I'm going to keep our attention uh, upon what I believe to be uh, of greater concern and that is a biblical response to that question on Bible prophecy. I'll be honest with you. Uh, this assassination attempt and of course every day new details are coming forth. There seems to be video evidence that's just been released within hours of a second hidden shooter on a direct line from the opposite side of the young man who was called out to be the shooter and killed at that very site. There are all kinds of questions circulating, but I'm not going to uh, run down uh, that road of uh, speculation and assumption. It, it's, it's of no profit to those of you who are serious students of, of the scripture. I did hear a silly rumor that the FBI has uh, launched an investigation into Donald Trump's assassination attempt, and apparently they're considering charging him with four counts. It may be that President Trump will be guilty of interfering with a sanctioned assassination attempt. Secondly, he may be guilty for leaving the scene of a shooting with only minor injuries. Uh, the third charge is the unauthorized use of a miracle. And then fourthly, he may be charged with conspiring with God uh, to survive. Well, I hope you have a sense of humor, but it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, let's answer these three questions and uh, get right into the heart of what we're talking about today. Number one, did God prevent the assassination attempt of Donald Trump? Trump, uh, or perhaps I should say, did God prevent the assassination of, of Donald Trump? Uh, I don't think there's anyone, regardless of your political party, any of you that follow me for any length of time know how I feel about politics, and I don't mean to be hard-hearted or calloused or critical, but I don't have faith in either side of the aisle. I don't have faith in anything that man has his fingerprints on. My faith is in the Bible that I hold in my hand, and I still believe what we used to sing as children in Sunday school, he's got the whole world in his hands. Regardless of what goes on in these last days, I know God sits on the throne. 
That's why I love Bible prophecy as many of you do. It provides for us a clear roadmap for navigating the day and age in which we live. But again, regardless of political leanings, I don't think there's anyone who doesn't look at the facts of what transpired and realize the incredible odds of our former president surviving this assassination attempt. Uh, Donald Trump certainly quickly acknowledged what he believed to be uh, God's protection shortly after the attempt to take his life. Let me read what he posted after the assassination attempt. And to my knowledge, this was his first post, his first public response after he almost lost his life. He said, and I quote, Thank you to everyone for your thoughts and prayers yesterday as it was God alone who prevented the unthinkable from happening. We will fear not, which is a biblical term, but instead remain resilient in our faith and defiant in the face of wickedness. Our love goes out to the other victims and families. We pray for the recovery of those who were wounded and hold in our hearts the memory of the citizen who was so horribly killed. And so certainly Donald Trump believed that God alone, to quote him, God alone protected him from what could have been certain death. And when you begin to take a look at the forensic pictures, it provides evidence that the shooter, we now know, had his crosshairs uh, upon the center mass of Donald Trump's head. And for whatever reason, in the last moment, probably at the exact same time that the shooter was squeezing the trigger, uh, mysteriously, uh, Donald Trump moves his head in such a way that he avoided uh, being killed there on the spot. It has been stated that he mysteriously escaped death by less than two centimeters. I heard uh, another forensic report <clears throat> that stated one centimeter. But uh, when you look at some of the uh, pictures and the forensics that there will be upon the screen during this time, it is obvious that he mysteriously, uniquely moves his head at probably the exact time that the shooter squeezed off the shot. Uh, can I state with 100% certainty that God protected him uh, in that moment from death? Uh, I cannot. But do I believe that there's evidence that seemed to provide a supernatural intervention that protected him from an easy, close-range shot that should have ended his life? I'll admit, yes, I do. It just seems that somehow there was intervention there that saved his life. Now listen, I don't know what your position on guns and rifles is. It doesn't matter. We shouldn't feud about certain things. I've been involved, as most of you know, in world missions for over 45 years. I've been in over 63 countries of the world. I've been in remote places, just to give you an example, in the Arctic Circle, where people depend upon their weapons to put food on the table for their family in the Arctic Circle. Uh, they depend upon harvesting a moose in the fall. They depend upon harvesting salmon and smoking them and putting them away. And, and uh, there are still people who live what is called subsistence life, and they depend upon their rifles to provide food for their table. For those of you who think that meat grows on styrofoam in the local grocery store, you need to have a little bit of a rude awakening. I have no problem with people who hunt to provide for their families, and I have done so. But I'll tell you this, I could take one of your grandchildren, let's just say you have a grandson or a granddaughter, 9, 10, 11 years old, and within 15 minutes, I could give them basic fundamental training and put them at a rifle stand 
and show them how to put the crosshairs on a target, trust me when I tell you that missing from 130 yards with a high-powered rifle, which the shooter had uh, in the pictures, it's obviously some AR. I've heard uh, one report that it was a 5.56 NATO round, which is an incredibly fast, flat shooting round. To miss from 130 yards is almost uh, not possible. Uh, if you took a trained assassin, uh, you, it wouldn't be a matter of missing the head. You could ask him which eye to shoot, and they would be successful. So when you look at all of the circumstances and all of the evidence and all of the unfolding forensics, uh, there just seems to be something supernaturally that could have been a part of intervening to uh, save his life. Now, obviously, there are all kinds of Christians in, in his life, in his family. He has a council of pastors that religiously pray for him. Daily Bible studies, daily prayer. Donald Trump, I don't know whether he's a Christian or not. I'm not sure if he openly proclaims. I think he does. I don't know. I don't have access to the Lamb's Book of Life. It's my full-time job to make sure I get to heaven. I'm doing my best to make sure you and your family get to heaven. I'm not going to be critical and judgmental as to the legitimacy of Donald Trump's faith. But certainly he has made it clear that he believes in God, that he believes in Jesus, that he believes in the Bible, that he believes in prayer, and so on and so forth. Uh, do I believe that there's a possibility that there was supernatural intervention to protect his life? Yes, I do. Question number two, what do I think about all of the prophets and all of the prophecies that are all over social media concerning this assassination attempt? Now, before I get into that, I want to offer a, a prologue, as it were, for my comments because I don't want you to think that I do not believe in the supernatural. I wholeheartedly believe in the supernatural and believe in the gifts that God has given. I absolutely support the biblical uh, passage in the fourth chapter of Ephesians that speaks about gifts that God gave uh, to the church. As a matter of fact, let's take the time to turn there. Open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4. If you're a new student of the Bible, that's in the New Testament. Galatians, Ephesians, chapter 4, and go down to verses 11 through 14, and let me read what the gifts that God gave to the church are. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 14, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, the Bible said, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Now, pause there. If you listen to Bible study content, sooner or later, you're going to come across people who teach and say that, yes, God gave those gifts to the church, but those gifts ended with the death of the last apostle. And uh, they are oftentimes in the world of theology called cessationists based upon the word cease or ceasing. And there are many that uh, would probably attack me for what I'm about to say, which is fine. But those who believe in cessationism, those who believe that the gifts that God gave to the church ended with the death of the last apostle, have a serious problem with this passage doctrinally to exegete and explain. Primarily, it says God gave these gifts to the church. And the church is not a building, it is the church age. Doctrinally, what do we know about the church age? The church age began with the first advent of Christ, his birth, and it ends with the second advent of Christ, which is the rapture. So Ephesians 4 tells us that the gifts were not just for the apostles' time. They were gifts given to the church. Let's read on. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, 
the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Verse 12, their responsibility is to equip God's people. Pause again. Were there God's people when this was spoken? Yes. Are there God's people now? Yes. Again, a hurdle for those who believe that these gifts ended with the death of the last apostle. Let's read on. To equip God's people to do his work and to build up, here it is again, the church. Then the body of Christ. Is the church still in existence? Yes. Is the body of Christ still in existence? Yes. So these five gifts, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, were given as gifts to the church. And I believe the scripture is clear that those callings and the operation of those gifts are legitimate throughout the church age. Let's read on. Verse 13. This will continue. Run your highlighter through that. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we, will be, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Is there perfect unity in the church, in the world today, or has there ever been? No. There are thousands upon thousands of denominations and disagreements and doctrinal feuding and and uh, some that teach that, you know, if you believe this way, you're teaching the doctrines of devils and the back and forth. There has not been unity in the body of Christ from the birth of the church until modern times. When will there be perfect unity for the believers? I believe that is a future time. Until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every kind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Why don't you run your highlighter through that? People trying to trick us with lies so clever, they sound like the truth. And that is the problem today, is social media is burgeoning with more and more people claiming to be prophets, and a lot of what they're saying is not only not biblical, it's absurdity. And we need to have a way of defining that and testing that, and I'm going to give you some instruction. Now, according to the Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy, there are 1,239 prophecies in the Old Testament. There are 578 prophecies in the New Testament, and that gives us a total of 1,817 prophecies in the entirety of the Bible. Now, obviously, some of the prophets in the Bible were more outspoken than others. But if you were to take all 40 authors in the Scripture and divide those 40 authors into all of the prophecies in the Bible, then that would mean that they gave, on average, now again, it's important that you hear that, on average, 45 prophecies each in their lifetime. So well, how did you arrive at that again? 40 authors in the Bible times 45 prophecies equals the total number of prophecies both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And again, I'm just creating a baseline. But using that as a baseline, the average prophet in the Bible prophesied less than once a year throughout their lifetime. And that is not really how we see prophets Today And again, I don't want to be legalistic. I don't want to be uh, the prophet police here. I believe in the office of the apostle. I believe in the office of the prophet. 
I believe in the office of the evangelist. I've operated in that gift. That's my calling from the age of 17 until now, going on five decades. I believe in evangelism and reaching unreached people around the world. My life has been completely dedicated to that. And now as president of a Bible college, I'm trying to pass that same passion and fire into the hearts of every single student, that regardless of their calling, that they might always remember that the Great Commission is the assignment, reaching unreached men and women and boys and girls is the divine assignment. If a prophet's predictions do not come true, then they are not speaking for God because God can't lie. Now, as simplistic a Bible truth as that is, many people give people these wide passes and say, well, they got a prophecy right last year. That's not the standard. When a prophet speaks, they are literally saying, I am speaking on behalf of God. That's a serious claim. So when somebody says, I prophesy, they literally are saying, I now speak as the mouthpiece of God. That's the standard. And the biblical standard was 100% accuracy. And because there is such a prolific rise in social media of prophets and prophetesses and so on, there seems to be a bit of lightness and a lowering of that biblical standard. I repeat, if any prediction of a prophet or a prophetess does not come true in detail, then they are not speaking on behalf of God because God cannot lie. And there's been a lot of attention to so-called social media prophets, one in particular. I've had uh, several that have asked me about it. Some of you perhaps have seen it. I'll not mention his name because it's not important, but it's circulating all through social media. And many people have seen it, many people have asked, and it's about a man who prophesied that he had a vision of an attempted assassination upon Donald Trump. And he said that the bullet went by his ear and his eardrum exploded and they were able uh, to protect him and remove him and so much of what he said uh, was almost uncanny. A lot of people say, wow, you know, this guy actually prophesied, you know, months ago that he had a vision of an attempt upon the president and, and that the bullet went right by his ear. He said ear. He actually said ear. Well, when you sit down, and again, not being critical, not trying to be the prophetic police, but when you take a prophecy like that, and the Bible says to judge things according to the integrity of the Bible, it's a false prophecy. First of all, if you listen to the entire prophecy that he gave and not the edited comments that he pulled out of his prophecy and put up on his page, but if you listen to the entire prophecy, there were many things that were not accurate. Uh, for example, even as uncanny as it was that he said an attempted assassination uh, upon Donald Trump, a bullet that went whizzing by his ear, the bullet didn't whiz by his ear, it hit his ear. Secondly, he said, and his eardrum exploded. Well, it lets me know he's not an outdoorsman. Uh, you don't have ear damage from a bullet going by or every soldier that ever lived would be deaf. Uh, you don't have an exploding eardrum because a bullet went by, even if it goes by quickly. All you're going to hear, I have been in the woods when irresponsible hunters have fired and I laid down uh, by a dead tree and I listened to the sound of bullets whizzing and hitting leaves and limbs and laid there until uh, the deer had run by from another farm. I was young at the time. I never hunted that farm again after that. It was like Vietnam, but I'll never forget the sound of bullets whizzing by in close proximity. It's a, it's a frightening, surreal sound, but it doesn't do any ear damage. The damage would be done if they fired a, a, a gun off in close proximity to your ear. And so uh, his eardrums were, were not blown. Uh, 
And again, not trying to be super critical or pharisaical, but many people are circulating that video as if, you know, this guy must be a prophet because he got so close. Prophets don't get close. Prophecy gets it right. You speak on behalf of God. God doesn't speak in those type of generalized terms. And uh, being president, by the way, being president of the United States of America legitimately, mathematically, is the most dangerous job on the face of the earth. And uh, I love all of my friends in Alaska, and there's a very famous program uh, called, uh, I think it's called Deadliest Catch or whatever, and certainly guys that work on the Bering Sea harvesting crab, uh, that's not a job I, I covet. I've been on the Bering Sea uh, in a small boat when uh, my life was, was threatened. I have great respect for the Bering Sea. So if you're from Alaska and you know these uh, crab fishermen, hats off. You're a bunch of courageous, rugged people, and I respect that. But as far as mathematically, a lot of people don't know this. The most dangerous job on earth is being the American president. Let me back that up with fact. 19 presidents, 19 presidents and candidates have been threatened with assassination. Six of them were killed, three of them were wounded, and 10 were unhurt. Not to mention the untold numbers of attempts upon presidents or candidates that were hidden from the press. We have no number of that other than we know that it happens on a pretty frequent basis. There have been 46 presidencies, not presidents. There have been 46 presidencies. There have been 45 presidents, uh, including our current president, Joe Biden. So anybody prophesying an assassination upon a, an American president your odds are better than 1 in 10, be somewhere between 11 and 12 uh, percent based on that uh, math. I haven't heard any of these prophets predict an assassination. I've heard all of them talk about an assassination attempt. Well, let's look at the math on that. If you predict an assassination attempt upon an American president, the odds of that being fulfilled are between 70 and 80 percent. One of the easiest things to prophesy and be accurate is to prophesy an assassination attempt upon a president. Now again, I have utmost respect for the legitimate gifts that God gave to the church. I believe they're valid, I believe they're operational. I believe they serve the prophet that the Bible tells us would profit the church and the body of Christ and so on. So I am not in any way trying to say that there are no prophets. There are. But what I am telling you is that Jesus warned us that one of the prolific signs of the last days would be a rise of false prophets. Let me give you three common traits of questionable prophets. And this is important. I would encourage you to write it down. Here's a way biblically that you can kind of roughly tuck into your heart to evaluate whether somebody you're listening to is a legitimate prophet. Number one, beware of social media prophets who prophesy continuously with vague generalized language. I often hear this. Uh, there's someone out there that the Lord gave me this prophecy for. Well, uh, there's about 8 billion people out there. So anything you say, there is a pretty good chance that that spaghetti is going to hit the wall and stick. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to say that, but when they say I'm a prophet, that's different. You know, a pastor can come on a Facebook feed or a social media feed and, and be speaking and, and in his heart say, you know, I just feel prompted in my heart. There's someone that needs to hear that. That's different. That's different. But when somebody claiming to be a prophet gives a vague, generalized prophecy, then they preface it by saying there's someone out there. There's no accountability to that. 
Anybody can do that. Nobody holds you to an account. I remember being in a service, and uh, I hope this won't offend you, but to give you just a, a raw, rugged example of what I'm talking about, uh, there was a man who probably was not called into the ministry, trying to pretend he was called into the ministry. I was actually in the service. I didn't hear about it. I was there. It was my home church. And he got up and said, the Lord has given me a prophecy. And I don't know what he meant to say, but he pointed to the right side of the congregation. It was a large church that, you know, had maybe a thousand seating capacity. So it wasn't like a small church, but he pointed over to the right and he said, I, I see there's a woman on the right side of the auditorium with a breast. Now, maybe he meant to say with a disease or a tumor, but he didn't. Uh, I think the odds are pretty good that if you make a prediction or a prophecy that there's a woman in the church with a breast, I think you've got a pretty good chance of hitting the bullseye with that every single time. But I say all of that, and you know these things happen. Some of you have had things like that, or worse, happen in a local church. You've been in the service. Beware of people who say they're speaking on behalf of God, but their language is always vague and breakthrough and promotion. And, and God's going to increase, and beware, I'm just saying. I'm not saying that it won't be God. I'm just saying beware when somebody always claiming to be a prophet never has anything detailed to say. Uh, one of the last specific prophecies that, that I gave, and I've only given a handful in my lifetime, but I, I spoke to a woman. And I told her what her husband's job was, which was a trucker. I asked her, I said, does your husband recently, did he recently start a new route, a new account to the state of Illinois? She said, yes. I said, did he recently tell you that he'll not be home for Thanksgiving? She said, yes. I said, he has not a, a girlfriend, not an affair, he is married to another woman. He's recently married a second woman in the state of Illinois, and you're going to find that's why he's taken this new account. And uh, I even stated he normally always, he had people that worked for him, he had a trucking business. I said he normally just drives his truck routes locally so he can be home. She said, yes, most of our marriage. But I said recently he's now got a new account in Illinois, yes. And everything came to pass. That is a detailed prophecy. Not there's someone out there uh, that's married, that has two legs. Uh, I, I see you putting shoes on before noon. Uh, I, I see you sitting at a table and eating a meal. Yes, several times in your life. You've, you, you know, that kind of foolishness needs to be called out because it is false prophecy. Number two, beware of social media prophecies that have a side hustle. What do you mean side hustle? I've seen prophets that uh, uh, sell vitamins and, uh, you know, for, you know, $99 a month, you can take the same vitamins that I take. And not only will it help your eyes to see better in the natural, I believe it'll help your eyes to see better in the spiritual. Beware of prophets with snake oil and side hustles. Number three, beware of social media prophets who schedule private, personal prophecy calls. Can you imagine Elijah, you know, sending out on his Facebook page, uh, those of you that would like to join me Thursday at 9 o'clock at night, I have a private prophecy, personal call for you, and uh, I'd like you to be on that call. And then be very careful of those that do that and they have a monthly fee for insider information. You know, if you support our ministry, $19.99 a month, every month you can be invited to be on a prophecy call. Personal words are given. When somebody starts to put a fee on prophecy, then run. I'll just say that. Run, turn your back, run, run fast. Jesus warned us in the Bible that there would be a rise of false prophets in the last times. In Matthew 24, in fact,
fact, if you don't have this highlighted in your Bible, let me pause to take you there. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 24, Jesus warned us. He said, for false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. See, I have warned you about this ahead of time. Again, the biblical standard for a legitimate prophet is 100% accuracy. And I remind you, again, as a baseline on average, those prophets in the Bible prophesied on average less than once a year throughout their life. Now, again, that's not a standard. I'm not saying somebody that doesn't operate in that gift can't prophesy more. But uh, I'm always skeptical of these people that are prophesying multiple times a day, hundreds of posts, et cetera, et cetera. And, and forgive me if, if you feel like I'm being harsh. I'm not meaning to be harsh. I've just met too many people in my travels that have been scammed and deceived. And many have le left the faith, lost their faith because of such actions. Lastly, and I close with this, is it possible that this assassination attempt upon Donald Trump fulfilled a prophetic passage in the book of Revelation? And uh, which passage was that? It was our text. Uh, <clears throat> Revelation, one last time, turn there and then we'll pray. Uh, Revelation 13 and 3. I saw that one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed, and the whole world marveled at his miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. There are some of these so-called social media prophets that are trying to connect Donald Trump to being potentially the Antichrist because he had a head wound and uh, because he's been put up on a higher place in his political um, points and polls, and he's become an icon to some. And I mean, it's almost been uh, frightening how some people have reacted as if he's now a god in their eyes. Let me tell you something. I pray that America becomes a great nation again. But only God can make America great again. Only God can make America great again. And so the answer to this is unequivocally no. Donald Trump is not a candidate for being the Antichrist. And I'm going to give you reasons why. Uh, first of all, the book of Revelation in the 13th chapter, we know when that happens. And it's not now, has nothing to do with an upcoming election in the United States of America, Revelation 13 takes place halfway through the tribulation period. The rapture hasn't even taken place yet. The tribulation certainly hasn't started. The tribulation is seven years in length, and Revelation 13 doesn't transpire until three and a half years into the tribulation. So just the prophetic, biblical timing of that in eschatology helps us to to say, no, Donald Trump is not the Antichrist. He is not a potential candidate to be the Antichrist. Uh, another reason we know that is in the Old Testament, Daniel prophesied the sexual proclivities of the Antichrist. The Bible said that he will have no desire for women. You'd have a really difficult time making that case for Donald J. Trump. Uh, another reason we know for a fact he's not the Antichrist or a candidate, he wasn't fatally wounded. Uh, he certainly wasn't resurrected from the dead. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and predict that J.D. Vance is not the false prophet. And so for those of you who are hearing these innuendos or claims or crazy prophecies trying to link Donald Trump in this assassination attempt into the book of Revelation or future prophecy. Just know you should uh, delete that person that you're listening to from your list of trusted sources. Uh, they're some type of unlettered, uh, perhaps even perverted 
interpretation of scripture to make such grandiose leaps run from people that don't start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible. Let me close with this. How many times have I challenged you out of the 24th chapter of Matthew? How many times have you heard me say, if you don't learn anything else about Bible prophecy, learn Matthew 24, 24. What does it say? It says, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. Are you living ready to meet the Lord? That is the main reason for our content and for our channel and for our teaching and for answering your questions and reaching out to you and opening up the scriptures and walking through and trying to bring biblical clarity in these last days in which we live is I want you to be ready to meet the Lord. I don't want you to die without Christ. I don't even want you to live without Christ. When you live for Christ, he'll break the curse of sin. He'll break the curse of sickness and disease and infirmity. He has the power to break the poverty and the lack that you may have been raised in generationally. There is nothing but the power of Christ to take you from where you are at to where he wants you to be. But where does it begin? How do you have, one of the most frequently asked questions, how do you have a knowledge that your heart is right with God? How can I know? that I'm right with God? How can I know that my sins are forgiven? How can I be sure that if the Lord were to come today that I'd be ready to go? Number one, you have to recognize you're a sinner. Number two, you have to repent of your sin. Jesus said in Luke's gospel, unless you repent, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And number three, you have to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. Will you pray with me right now as we end this broadcast, wherever you're at? And when we're done praying, if you prayed this prayer with me, and you're saying, Tiff, I want to be right with God. I want to be a real Christian. I want you to go into the comments section and simply write, Tiff, I prayed that prayer, or whatever you want to share for a testimony. Pray with me wherever you're at. Just say out loud, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, I believe you were speaking to me. Down in my heart, I want to live every day ready to meet the Lord. And so today I recognize my sin. I repent of my sin. In childlike faith, I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Christ. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive all my sin. Cleanse my mind, my body, and my spirit, and make me holy in your eyes. Today I vow I'll serve the Lord. In place of my weakness, give me your strength. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.